Uh, my name is Kendrick Perkins. I'm the education specialist at the Historic New Orleans Collection. And I'm joined today with Jenny Schwarzberger, uh, the curator of education. Good morning. And, and uh, Rachel Gaudry, uh, the education coordinator. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are the Historic New Orleans Collection, and we are located in the French Quarters. We are a museum, research center, and publication or organization. We produce exhibits, publish books, and create programs that tell our story. Uh, our mission is to share and preserve the history of New Orleans, Louisiana, and the Gulf region. Um, we do this by, uh, we, have founding, we have a founding era virtual exhibit um, that explores our early French colonial period. We have purchased lives uh, virtual exhibit, which explores uh, the domestic slave trade in New Orleans. Um, we have a book coming out called Monumental, which is going to talk about Oscar Dunn, our first uh, govern Black governor in Louisiana. Um, we also have Economy Hall, um, a book that talks about reconstruction. And then um, we also, the education department, we have created uh, something called the NOLA Resistance Interactive Lesson Plan, which focuses on the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Um, before we begin, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement a land acknowledgement is a statement that recognizes that the indigenous people are the original inhabitants and caretakers of this land and its resources. This is just one way that we want to address some of the intentional erasure of indigenous people in the historical record. Today, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Homa, Chittimacha, and Choctaw people on which we learn, work, and live today. We also acknowledge other indigenous communities whose traditional lands cross Louisiana board, borders. The, Tuna, the Tunica Biloxi, uh, the Atacapa, the Cherokee, Cado, Opelousas, uh, Cachada, and Natchez. By making this land acknowledgement, we hope to express our gratitude and appreciation to those whose homelands we live on today. We also pledge to work better to understand the history that has brought us to these lands and our roles within that history. Um, today, we'd like to welcome Ms. Leona Tate to the Education Department's uh, community chat. How you doing, um, Ms. Leona? Good, fine this morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing well. Um, before we begin, I would like to also provide another acknowledgement and note that the, six, the 60th anniversary of Ms. Tate's participation in the desegregation of New Orleans Public Schools is approaching in the next three days. And I would like to thank you for the sacrifices that you made for someone like myself to enjoy the rights that I have today. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, we have a few questions that we'd like to um, ask Ms. Leona. Um, I believe, Rachel, are you gonna ask the first yeah. question? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get us started. Ms. Leona, we're so pleased that you're gonna be with us today. I know we have a lot of people joining us that would love to ask you questions. So I'm just gonna jump into it. Right. Um, and this one is about kind of growing up in New Orleans for you. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of your fondest childhood memories and what did you and your family do for fun in New Orleans when you were very little? Well, my mother was always protective, so um... I think my fondest memories would be, you know, doing family things. We um, were very family oriented. Um, we visited our families, even in what we call country in St. Bernard Parish. Um, you know, my mother was really into her family. Um, every Friday or Saturday of the weekend, it was dinner at one of the other sisters' houses or at our house. So we did a lot of family stuff and, you know, Kind of miss that these days because nobody does that anymore, but that was exciting to us. Did you have a did you have a big family or was it a smaller family? My mother had 10 sisters and brothers. So we we, <laughs> we had a big family, but she didn't. It was just two of us in my household. So um um we had a lot of cousins. A lot of we have a lot of cousins. So that made it like a big family. It sounds fun. Yeah. It is. Was. Was. Yeah, my mom, she actually, um, you know, she was born in uh, 1957 mm -hmm. and uh, she she grew up in a ninth ward early on until Betsy came, mm -hmm. you know, and we had like three different generations living in one house, you know, and then 
when Betsy came, we kind of scattered out throughout the city, you know. Um, mm -hmm. My mom, she moved uptown. But um, I'm going to move on to the next question, though. Uh, I wanted to know, did you have any personal experiences with Ms. Dorothy May Taylor? And, um, and what opinions do you have on her contributions uh, to the civil rights movement in New Orleans? I'm gonna be honest with you. I I knew her. I not personally, you know. I met her during you know time when she was campaigning. Um, but I think I was still in high school during that time, and um, I, I I I I do remember her being the first black lady to be on the council. Um, but that's really as much as I could really tell you about her. But I know she had done something instrumental in the city, you know. So I was, mm -hmm. you know not in tune as I should have been, but I was right. kind of, you know, I recognized that she had done something special. Yeah. Yeah. I guess part of the reason why I asked was that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I thought that she was somewhat instrumental in, you know, on a policy level and civil rights level in trying to, um, you know, help with desegregation. And I thought maybe as a little girl, you know, she might have, I don't know. I was hoping she talked to you, gave you a pep talk, you know, before you, <laughs> you know, was, before you were gonna do what you had to do. If so she I, did, I don't, I don't remember that, but I, I don't remember talking with her on a personal level, you know, like that. All right. Miss mm -hmm. yeah. um, Leona, I am mm -hmm. curious, do you have a favorite notable New Orleanian? A musician, artist, politician? Oh, wow. Um, or it can be more than one favorite. Who was who? What I, well, I don't know. I got a lot of favorite notables. Um, I don't know. You know, I was pretty much into what we had done. You know, um, yeah. And maybe, you know, I can remember the, the civil rights leaders at that time that supported my mother, you know, and I'm thinking that was probably because we looked up to them for everything. And the the main person I can that what comes to me would be Alvarez Chapital, and he was um, president of the NAACP at that time, and I can remember being engaged with him a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's see. The next question is from me again, and I guess <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I I want you know I, I want to know kind of like what you just the person that you just mentioned in your interactions with with him so i'm asking about you know uh the past as well and i said uh do you get did you get involved in the campaign um to get dutch moria elected in 1977 um and do you recall the mood of the city then i was actually born that year so um you know i <laughs> I'm, I'm i wanted to know what was the mood of the city you know we were about to have our first black mayor and i don't know if you you know i actually helped as a teenager i helped campaign with uh, Mark Moriel. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been on too many, you know, people doing that, but it was, that was my first time doing it. And I did feel a sense of accomplishment when he, um, you know, became mayor. Right. I, I don't think I was involved in the campaign, but I was very, I felt how the city, you know, just, just the environment at that time was similar to what we just went through. You know, it was something that we all needed. And we all want it. And um, I can remember, you know, just people in my community, how involved they were in that election. You know, so I, I, I think that was a, a, it was a big movement and it was a, it was a must that we do it. Thank you. I'm gonna hop back on. Um, I wanna know about your life kind of these days and I know you're hard at work at the Leona Tate Foundation for Change, um, but I wanna know when you're not doing that work, what do you enjoy doing in your free time? And if you have any hobbies or interests that you could share with us? Oh, I'm a full-time grandmother. I'm a full-time great-grandmother. <laughs> and anybody that know me could tell you that's, that's my life. You know, I spend a lot of time with my great-grandkids and, and do whatever I can to help them. And um, I don't know, I have a friend that said, they don't know how somebody sprawled all 12 of your grandchildren, but they are spoiled. They are, 
they really are. But that's mainly what I do. I um, I look forward to to doing things with them. You know, even when they don't want me to, I get involved anyway. <laughs> and could you tell us a little bit about the foundation and the work that you're doing? Yes. Well, the foundation's been around since 2009. Um, and I don't know, it seems just like everything just trickled up on us. You know, it was always my desire to get something done at McDonough 19. But, you know, when I first started out, it was just to get it open as a school because after Katrina, there was only going to be one school. Well, that, that fell through. So I knew it needed to be something educational because when I visit local schools here, our children don't know the history that ha happened right here in New Orleans. Uh, and I felt like this would, could be the place that they could learn that. And um, that's what we put our foot forward on. We got the um, foundation started and, and I just started, I guess, working on the school board's nerves <laughs> on getting the building turned over. But it, it they didn't really know what they wanted to do with the building. And, we, you know, our, I think our process was the wait time, was was just waiting just to see, you know, what they were gonna do. So they finally decided to let it go. And, you know, that I said, well, this is our time now, you know, we need to make this move. So we did and we, um, January 31st of this year, we, we, we now own the building, we bought the building and, um, Hopefully this will be a racial healing location for everybody. Um, I felt like when the three of us went into that building, it, it stirred up a lot of racism and a lot of changes. Um, everybody just scattered. It was in white flight and I really wanted to be a place to heal. People, we need to talk. We need to talk. It's some dialogue needs to be done and hopefully the Tate at 10 and Prevost with Tep Center for short will be that place. That's what I'm hoping for. That's wonderful. Is, is that what's behind you? I see some photos and some labels. No, right now I'm in, this will be included in there, but I'm in the Lower Ninth Wall Living Museum right now. And Great. Well, Miss Leona, we have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. And um, and please, y'all continue to send your questions in in the chat or the Q&A function. Um, mm -hmm. But Miss Leona, our first one is, um, let's see. How do you tell the story of the New Orleans Four to your grandchildren and great-grandchildren? <laughs> I'm a, well, right now, they're, they're experiencing a lot, a lot because it's, it's more open to them now. Um, I'm going to be honest, for years, I didn't talk about it at all. My own children didn't know um, who I was for a long time um, be, because, it, you know, during that time it was just overwhelming, and and I knew if I, it, it got to their schools, things would be different for them. So, you know, I I, I didn't talk about it, but they they my you know grandkids are kind of young, and um, well, the older ones, you know, they know they know and. But I'm grandma, you know, so that's <laughs> that. That's the difference, you know. It, it doesn't make no difference to them, you know. But they're they're excited to know that I was a part of that. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, another question we have. Um, thank you to you, Miss Leona, for your tenacity and continued work for civil rights. Your pathbreaking steps into McDonough 19 continue to inspire. Your attendance at SEMS is a lesser known story. Can you comment on your experience at SEMS? SEMS, I spent one year there in third grade and it was myself, Gail and Tessie and um, it was horrible. Um, we didn't have the marshals or the police protection anymore. So we, we really endured a lot at SEMS. Um, we were definitely afraid to do a lot. We were, didn't, couldn't go in the cafeteria to eat because um, Somebody was going to spit in your food and it was going to knock it out of your hand. Um, you were definitely afraid to use the restroom alone. Everything we do, I think this is when we, we have a bond that can't be broken, the three of us. And I think at Sims is really when our bond connected. And um, our only place that we felt comfortable was outside under, under a little tree. Um, but Sims, the, some of the teachers would coerce the students to call us names or um, 
threw signs as if we had an odor. Or, or it was, it was, it was horrible. You know, it was really horrible. You know, and I wouldn't want to put that kind of pressure on nobody's child. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question. Um, mm -hmm. This is from a first and second grade class. Um, mm -hmm. It says, we have been talking about how one person can make a change in the world. Did you know that you were making a change when you went to school that day? And how did you find the courage? I had no idea. And I don't really think our families knew that it was going to go nationwide. Um, we thought it was, they, I think they just thought it was a local thing. Um, I knew I was going to a new school, a different school, um, but I really didn't understand why. Uh, and then my family didn't talk much around me so that I wouldn't be afraid. And I wasn't afraid, you know, I really wasn't afraid. And I was very comfortable being alone with the U.S. Marshals, um, but, um, it was years down the line before I really realized what I had done. It was years, yeah. Um, and so kind of in that same vein, I'm um, saying that I think the gravity and the weight of what was happening mm -hmm. didn't hit you till a little bit later. Um, we have mm -hmm. another question that says, um, somebody who wants to know how you felt when you first stepped outside of the car in front of the school, um, in front of McDonough 19. <laughs> I felt like, I was going to school and missing a parade because that's what it looked like to me, being from New Orleans and knowing that a parade used to pass in front of that building, you know. And when my car that I was in turned that corner, all I could see was mobs of people and police on horseback. So being six years old from New Orleans, that's the only thing we could relate it to was that a parade was coming. And I kind of remember asking my mom why I had to go to school and everybody else got to watch the parade, you know. And she said, no, that's not the case. So I, I, that's, that's what I felt like when I, I got out of that car. I just felt like everybody was out there waiting for the parade to come, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, another question. Um, somebody would like to know, who were the other people accompanying you when you entered the building? Um, I, I guess they mean um, the first time you went into the school building. My mother was with me the first day and we each had two U.S. Marshals. Um, we were in separate cars. Um, but I, I, for, for, I think the first day we kind of all drove up together and um, went in the building right behind each other or not far behind each other. But um, it was my mother and two U.S. Marshals that were with me the first day. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and y'all, please keep these questions coming. These are, are wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, you mentioned that you, Gail, and Tessie have an unbreakable bond. Right. Did all of your parents share a similar bond? Yeah, and I think they shared that they had that bond even before we went to school because they were being prepared. I'm sure through the NAACP office on what could happen and, you know, because I remember my, my, my mother going to had, having to go to a lot of meetings and, and they all were involved in these meetings and they all knew each other even before that day. So um, I, I'm, I'm, they shared a bond, but I'm sure it was because of safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and yet, Miss Leona, I'll share from a personal point of view too. Um, you know, I've been familiar with your story for a while, and um, it's really since I've become a parent that I've thought about it in a whole, a different light. And now, when I I think of your story, um, I don't just picture it from the point of view of you as a, a young girl going into the school. I also picture it from the point of view of parents, and mm -hmm. that to me has added a whole nother level. Um, um, okay, lots more fantastic questions. Um, two that kind of go together. Um, sorry, they're pouring in. This is wonderful. Um, so from one um, teacher, we've asked, can you share a very short vo version of your story? And then we also have gotten, what's the, what was the first day like for you in Gail and Tessie? 
And everybody, we're gonna point you to a very in-depth interview that Ms. Leona has done with an oral historian at the collection to get a full um, account of her sharing this story. But yeah, Ms. Leona, if you wouldn't mind giving kind of a, a short version. Well, that morning, um, <clears throat> when I woke up that morning, my house was filled with um, family and friends, just you know, there to support my mother. I thought it was like a holiday because that's the kind of stuff you see on Christmas holidays and stuff when everybody's there doing something to prepare the dinner. But <clears throat> everybody seemed to be in a happy mood and all of a sudden um, a black car pulled up in front of my door and the US Marshals had arrived to, to bring us to the school. And I can remember my household getting real quiet. I can remember that silence, you know, so. I knew something was about to happen then, you know, and my mother and I went to the door and um, she told me, she said, when you get in the car, you sit to the back of the seat and do not put your face to the window. And I tell our children today that obedience played a big, big part of what we had to do. We had to, we had to listen. And um, I did. And um, we left with the marshals. It was exciting to me to get a ride to school when the school was in my neighborhood, when I used to walk 10 or 11 blocks to my old school. So, you know, it was a luxury for me to get a ride to school. So um, we pulled up in front of the school and we got out. Um, that's when I saw the crowd. So we had to go to the office and the office was upstairs on the second floor. So we went up the, the stairs and it's 18 steps. I tell everybody I remember how many steps it was. And um, once we got in the building, I guess one of the parents or my mother and them approached the office. So we were asked to, to take a seat on a bench outside of the office. And we must have sat on a bench half that day waiting to be placed in a classroom. Um, I know we sat out there, and Tessa Gale and I played hopscotch on the tiles on the floor because we had been out there for a long time. But that's, mainly how the morning was. And then once we got placed in the classroom, it was it was white flight. The um, parents pulled their students out. Um, by three o'clock, we were only three students in that entire building for a year and a half. Thank you. Um, now, I know you've said that um, for a long time, you didn't talk about your experiences with your family, um, but we have uh, an attendee who's interested to know if you spoke with your parents about your experience um, when you were older. Um, and did you learn if kind of their thoughts surrounding this, were they afraid for you? Um, you know, and how did they um, kind of have the courage to, to persevere and, and encourage you um, to do the same? We talked about it. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you. My mama was so courageous. Um, I tell anybody if I had an ounce of courage, she had, I'd be dangerous. But <laughs> my dad was kept in out of the limelight for a long time because of where he worked. He worked in Saint Bernard Parish, so nobody knew his identity. Um, but you know, we talked about how it, it, it could have been. You know, but my mom always said that. Um, she paid her taxes just like everybody else did. And she felt like if that was gonna give me a better education, that's where I was gonna go. And that's just how she felt about it. But, um, you know, we didn't really, I mean, it was, by the time we really talked about it, it was a done deal. So um, it just lived like it was. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Thank you, all our attendees. Thank you so much for all of these amazing questions. I'm going to try to get to all of them. Um, so um, let's see. Let's go to um, after you started school, Miss Leona. How did it feel to be out in the community? Were you recognized, or was it only at school? Um, once we got home, we were so confined. Um, it wasn't very. It wasn't no more playing outside in the yard. It wasn't any more um, walking to the corner store um, or things like that. Um, everywhere we went, we were either, we were chaperoned by a police car that was watching our household. The marshals would bring us to school and bring us home, but the New Orleans Police Department guarded our houses and, you know, me moving around because on weekends 
I would go spend a weekend in Gentilly by my aunt and uncle and the car would follow me there. And I, I kind of remember that, but um, it was, if, if anybody was to come, if I had to, a friend or a cousin or somebody to come to, to play, we had to know that they were already coming and it would be inside, it would never be outside. In school was the same way. We never played outside. We had to bring our food and beverages. We couldn't look out of the windows. The windows were papered up. Um, our play area was under a stairwell inside the school building. But we had a, a very good first grade teacher that's, that was more motherly than anything. So she was right there with us. But as far as our childhood life, it was it was quite different after that. It was quite different. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if that's something too that um, a lot of people might not realize is that you taking this step and in, in your parents um, to, to integrate this school changed your entire life. It wasn't just something that changed your day to day as far as your mm -hmm. classroom and your school, but it was really a, a, a reimagining of your entire life. Is that correct? Right, it was. Um, and I think you asked me something about being recognized. I don't, I don't remember um, anybody recognizing me. If you didn't already know me, then I don't think you you would recognize me. You know, but I was recognized in um, the summers. My aunt and uncle would take me to New York, and we stopped in Roanoke, Virginia, at a hotel, and some reporters came in, and I and um, they recognized me and. So my uncle felt like, well, we need to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question. Um, this is one is from a first grade student. Um, did you know about Ruby Bridges and why did you go to different schools? Well, we went to different schools because schools were by districts then. We had to go to the school that we lived in. Yes, I knew Ruby. I, I knew Ruby before I knew Tessie and Gail because Ruby lived in an area where my mother's sister lived. So when we went to visit my mother's sister, my mom would always go talk to her mother. Um, but it was only because of the, the district where we, um, where we lived. That's why we were at different schools. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you touched on this briefly, but um, I would love to hear more about it if you have more to share. Um, somebody would like to know, what was your teacher like that first year at McDonough 19, your first grade year? Oh, she was wonderful. Her name was Miss Myers. Um, she was more motherly than a teacher, but we got an excellent first grade education, I'm gonna tell you that. Um, she didn't leave us alone at no time, you know, we went to the, if we had to go to the restroom, she was right there with us. You know, when we ate our lunch and sat under the stairway and played, her chair was there. She sat right there. And um, it, it, she was wonderful. She was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. Um, this is a, a big question from a first grader. Um, sometimes we feel left out of things. Um, how did you deal with feeling left out? Or did um, you feel left out? I might have felt left out with the, the media um, because I felt like they are supposed to be the ones to know the history of what happens that in our city, you know, and it, and it wasn't broadcast that way so um but you know it, it, it was fine you know I, you know i just i just people just don't do their research they don't do their homework and 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 that's what i try to preach today you know you just got to study more don't go by what everybody say at least try to try to research it on your own absolutely thank you mm -hmm. um 
Let's see. Um, a lot of these questions are wonderful. Um, it's very hard to, to choose. Oh, and this is something else that you touched on briefly, but if you would, um, if you don't mind speaking a little bit more about it, an attendees asked, um, did the parents of the white children at McDonough 19 withdraw them from school when you enrolled and how many white children were in your class that first year? Um, school was, now you gotta remember, we went there on no, in November. November 14th was our first day and school was in session. Each classroom had the full capacity of students. The whole school was, was filled with students. Um, once we, I remember going into the classroom and I don't know what was going on then, but it seems like, you know, I don't know what they were doing, but they, it seems like whatever they were doing, they were standing up. And I, I remember trying to speak to a little white girl and, it was like I was invisible. She didn't even respond. And, um, but their parents just started coming and just pulling them out of the classroom. You know, it was like, like a whirlwind. I mean, you know, it wasn't going to the office or checking them out. They were just coming to get their children. And, 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 and that's how it was. By the end of the day, they were all gone, you know. And we couldn't understand that, but it happened. Thank you. Um, and we have time for just one last question. Um, what are the latest developments with the Leona Tate Foundation for Change and the TEP Center? Well, we're under construction and we've been under construction since February. Um, the TEP Center, it's gonna be a lot. It's, it's really gonna be a lot. It's gonna have exhibits of what the happened in the, the civil rights movement with the desegregation of public schools, and we're gonna to touch on other, other civil rights movement. We're also gonna have People's Institute. I don't know if anybody's aware of them. They go around the world and they do, and they've been doing this over 40 years, teaching on doing racism workshops. They will be in the building with us and that will, um, they will be conducting that. And they also instituting a, a, what they're gonna call a community where undoing racism, racism will be taught to kids from kindergarten through high school. Um, our second and third floor will be low income housing for the elderly, starting with 55 year, years or older. And uh, we'll have 25 units on the second and third floor. But you know, I want the community involved. I want the tenants involved in, in, in the TEP Center. Um, it, it's gonna be a lot, you know, it's really gonna be a lot. And I'm not, I always say the racism started there and I feel like this is where it should end. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Miss Leona. Um, thank well, you. thank you so much, Miss Leona. Thank you all of our attendees so much for coming to our virtual field trip today. Um, I am posting a link in the chat box for everybody. Um, and this is to a project that the Historic New Orleans Collection completed recently um, called NOLA Resistance, um, which documents um, local leaders in the civil rights movement um, in their own words, um, in video and oral histories. Um, Ms. Leona is prominently featured in this. Um, so you can visit that link to learn more about her story, um, see a fantastic video. And um, we also encourage you, if you have any further questions or comments, I'm putting our email address in the chat box. Please don't hesitate to email us. Um, please check out our upcoming virtual field trips and um, thank y'all so much for attending. Y'all take care. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.